Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Arbitrary Lines, Nolan Gray's Conversation with the netizen James Caswell. Caswell. <laughs> I'm Jen Hawes, Partnership Manager here at Island Press. Here is what you can expect today. We have a fairly simple format for you all. First, James and Nolan are going to engage in a conversation around his book. Then we're going to open it up to some audience questions. If you'd like to submit your questions, please do so using the questions tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. If you have trouble using the GoToWebinar technology, please send me a note either through the questions tab or in the chat there. After today's event, we ask that you fill out a brief survey. All survey responses are read and used to help inform the programming that we create here at Island Press, so your voice really does count. Uh, the session is being recorded. Expect to receive an email with the recording in one or two days. You can grab a copy of uh, Nolan's book at Island Press. Use the code webinar at islandpress.org slash books slash arbitrary dash lines and you get 30% off with that code. Uh, just a, a bit about Island Press. And Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher and so much more. In a world flooded with information, Island Press connects the right ideas with the people who need, who need them to build sustainable cities and protect the natural world. Island Press's mission is to elevate voices of change, shine a spotlight on crucial issues, and focus attention on sustainable solutions, like we're doing here today. You can learn more about us and make a donation if you'd like to support our work at islandpress.org. Our Island Press is proudly partnering with Plant Edison and Plant Edison courses to bring you this event today. Plant Edison values independence, fostering innovation, advancing planning, and embracing diversity. Nolan is working on, on a course, or will be working on a course with Plant Edison. And if you'd like to hear more about the high quality courses that Plant Edison creates and get a 20% discount, you can do so uh, at checkout with the code Island Press at courses.planetizen.com. Uh, we have good news for folks today. You may receive one AICPCM from APA if, by attending this live event. If you need any help with your accreditation, you can reach out to us at uh, info at islandpress.org. We can help with that. So I'd like to introduce James here today as our moderator. James is Plan Edison's editorial director. He's been with them since 2014. He started his career in LA volunteering at a Skid Row Risk Reduction Center. He's worked as an editor at multiple publications and has also been a freelance contributor through his career. Also like to introduce Nolan Gray. Nolan is a professional city planner. He's just accepted a new position as the research director at California EMB. As he completes his PhD at UCLA's Lewis Center, he's also working there as a researcher. He is an affiliated scholar with the Mercatus Center at GMU. Nolan lives in LA and he is from Lexington, Kentucky. Before we begin this conversation today, I'd like to run a few polls. So I'm going to launch those for folks. The first poll is gonna be, where are you joining us from? So the poll is now open and we'll give a few seconds for people to share where they're at. Um, and once we get a critical mass, I will uh, close the poll and we'll do the next one. Thanks for your responses. All right. Looks like we've got uh, about 29% of the folks coming in from the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic, about 20% from the South, 20% from the West, 14% from somewhere else in the US and 14% from outside the US. So really nice uh, selection today. Um, and now I'd like to hear how familiar are you with planning itself? Not very, somewhat, highly, or you are a zoning expert? Will help inform our conversation as well. Thanks for your responses. We'll give you a few more seconds to complete this. Get about a critical mass. All right. 
response is still rolling in. Looks like we're good. Okay. Closing the poll now. So we've got um, everyone's familiar. Most people are highly familiar. 60% of you are highly familiar. And we've got several uh, amount of the audience that are planning, zoning experts, rather. So that's great. Um, so thank you all. I will turn it over to James to introduce Plan Edison and um, start the conversation. Thanks a lot, Jen. Uh, really happy to be here uh, speaking with Nolan Gray, who's um, you know obviously been a prominent figure in the planning discussion on social media and uh, various publications for a long time. And um, you know I'm kind of a planning nerd, so I'm I'm just happy to be here to talk about zoning and to talk about this book, Arbitrary Lines. <clears throat> you can see this is this is what we call a well thumbed copy of a book. It's been on a few camping trips and. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this. <clears throat> and actually, my first question kind of piggybacks on that last poll. And um, you know, we obviously have a lot of planning and zoning experts here, but what's your sense, Nolan, of of the expertise of planners and then the other planning involved, you know, citizens and elected officials? What's your sense of how well all these people working in planning and working on zoning really understand the consequences? of zoning and how does and how does that level of understanding affect the outcomes uh, that we'll talk about in a second yeah well i mean first uh, thanks so much to island and, and jen for coordinating this and of course everything with the book it's been fantastic uh and it's great to be talking to you james um <clears throat> i'm just glad they could get together two angelinos so we can teach the rest of the world how to build great cities because we've solved all of our problems here uh and they, they called us up to you know instruct everyone else um yeah, so that's a great way to start the conversation. Um, so, you know, I was a I was a practicing planner in New York City and Queens, and a lot of my work, my day to day work, had to do with with zoning. Uh, and you know, I think one of the lessons that I took away from that experience was the extent to which I think it's certainly people who work with zoning on a day to day basis generally have a pretty good grasp of what it does and then how it functions and what its goals are. Uh, but I regularly would encounter situations where even professionals who, you know, were zoning adjacent had maybe only the very vaguest notion of what zoning is, where it comes from, uh, how to fix it. Um, and then especially now, you know, we're living in this really weird moment, uh, right, where people actually care about zoning, uh, normal people, right, not just people like me and you, um, right? So you can you can open up the New York Times or the San Francisco Chronicle, and there's going to be op-eds on zoning weekend to weekend right uh presidential candidates and state governors are now expected to have positions on zoning um right zoning it used to be the case that you know if you're at a party and you say uh oh i work on zoning uh your conversation partner will suddenly have to go use the bathroom um now it's something that people are actually really interested in but this was one of the reasons that i wanted to write the book is i found that even some people who maybe had some of the right notions about zoning right so they had you know they maybe had some vague sense that it had to do with city planning or they had some idea that it was related to housing affordability issues or questions of segregation and sprawl, uh, often didn't really have a very clear sense of what zoning was or how it worked. So that's like one of the big things that I'm trying to do in the book. And that's what I cover in part one, what zoning is and, and where it comes from and in a way that's hopefully accessible enough to enjoy on a camping trip or on the beach. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks. And I, I think just to continue to frame the the scope of the book a little bit more, um, could you, there's there's four main critiques, and I think that maybe this informs why there's so much more public interest in zoning, and and it's become a little bit more accessible. The critiques that you offer, each one of them, are kind of a way into planning and its and its outcomes. I think. Could you talk a little bit about what those four primary critiques in the book are, and maybe to to justify some of the the prescriptions that you're going to offer later in the book um, and in this talk yeah so um part two of the book covers what i take to be four of the most compelling critiques of zoning today um and you know of course with the book you have to limit the scope of it I, there are a number of issues that i kind of leave on the table right like issues of corruption uh, or or issues of, of of architectural experimentation. But the four, I think, most compelling concerns that people have with zoning today, the first is uh, zoning and housing affordability, right? Um, so this is, a, this is a really fascinating issue because you know, I, I was a Mercatus uh, affiliated scholar and we have spent a lot of time talking to people in states like Utah 
for people in states like Florida or Tennessee uh, or Montana. And prior to the pandemic, we had to like convince people that this was a, a problem that they should be thinking about, right? Uh, there was this kind of notion of, oh, like zoning and land use and housing affordability, that's a California problem. They, the, they just don't know how to run their state. Uh, we don't have those problems here. Um, of course, that's dramatically changed over the last two years. Now, right, of course, these people are calling me up now. I'm at California MB, calling us up asking, you know, what should, how should we be thinking about these issues? Um, but so there's a very, very robust literature on the relationship between zoning and housing affordability. I kind of draw three lines here. The first is zoning makes a lot of, of housing just illegal to build, right? So most people on the call are probably aware that something like 70 to 95% of the typical city uh, doesn't allow multifamily to be built uh, in its residential areas, right? We, we allow residential, or excuse me, multifamily in a very small few pockets of the city uh, or certain extremely, um, well, the second mechanism here is that uh, zoning rules that increase the, what we might call the quality of housing, but above and beyond what people might otherwise have demanded, right? So this is rules that say, if you want to build uh, housing, you have to have so many parking spaces, regardless of if you're gonna drive, or if you're gonna have a single family home, it has to sit on a lot of at least a half acre, right? Uh, and then the third is the delays, and because of course, zoning has become much more discretionary, and the process has become much more onerous over the last 50 years in particular, uh, that's another source of, of issues. Uh, the second element here is I think blocking product, blo blocking mobility into high productivity regions, right? So historically Americans moved from uh, poor uh, and less productive parts of the United States to wealthier and, 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 and more productive uh, parts of the United States, right? So of course a famous example of this is the great migration of African-Americans out of the South. Uh, in, you know, in the Kentucky context where I'm from, of course, many hundreds of thousands of, of Appalachians moved to the industrial Midwest for opportunity after World War II. Um, but zoning constraints being most tight in our most productive and prosperous places makes that mobility harder and, of course, makes us collectively less innovative and productive. The third is something that, of course, was top of mind, especially when I was writing the book in 2020, and that's the issue of segregation. Um, so as I kind of argue in part one where I discuss the history of zoning, um, Segregation isn't this like accidental side effect of current zoning policies. You know, that's really core to the current policies. Uh, this notion that there will be different parts of the city for people of different income levels, and in the U.S. context, of course, that translates into race. And that was very deliberate um, in many zoning contexts. And then the final big critique that I level is um, the relationship between zoning and the environment, right? Uh, so of course, you know. Most people on the call probably now know, you know, cities are, are one of the most uh, incredible environmentally friendly inventions humanity's ever come up with. Uh, they save land and they reduce energy consumption in a modern context. Um, living in a multifamily building or switching your commute over from a car to a bus or a, a, a bicycle dramatically decreases your climate impact. Um, and so zoning, of course, makes this much more difficult to do. It heavily privileges greenfield development. And, and heavily discourages infill development. Uh, and I would just add too, as most of the countries going through a heat wave, there's also a regional element of this too. Uh, we make it very, very hard to build maybe in temperate places like uh, Southern California or the Bay Area. Uh, and we make it very easy to build uh, in uh, extremely hot places like uh, Arizona or, or Las Vegas uh, here on the West Coast. So those are the four big critiques that I kind of wanted to you know, they've been floating in the ether and people have been having these conversations, but there wasn't really one single book that you could send someone to to say, hey, this is kind of what, where the discourse on zoning is at. Yeah, great. Um, I And that brings up a question. I feel like you've really taken it a step further, though, in part three of the book and with your, you know, your recommendation to abolish zoning entirely. And where I saw, sort of located some of your predecessors uh, in like books by like, Hurt and and Fischl and, and even to a degree uh, Donald Shoup, who I understand is on the call. Hello, Shoup Dog, if you're if you're out there. <laughs> um, uh, but you know where where some of those books, uh, predecessor books, have problematized zoning and its outcomes, or even the history of zoning. Um, thinking specifically of zoned in the USA. Um, You've taken a step further, and really, you're pr promoting this ambitious step. Uh, can you talk about why, you know, if if you've built this book that like gives a record of of these critiques in a way, you've also just 
gone a step further. What, why was that necessary for you? And, and how did those, maybe some of your predecessors or the, the work that had gone into critiquing zoning help you make that uh, step? Yeah, well, so, you know, first I think it's worth sort of putting up some parameters on the conversation uh, for what I'm talking about when I talk about zoning, right? So uh, drawing from my understanding of just absorbing a lot of zoning literature, zoning is trying to do two things, right? It's trying to segregate land uses and, you know, segregates, a, of course, a, a loaded word, but I mean that in a very value neutral way, right? We're just going to break the city out by residential and then different types of residential, commercial, industrial. That's the first bit of zoning. And then the second is uh, we're going to control density. We're going to place very strict limits on how much floor area and how many units can be built. And we're going to do this for every single parcel in a city. And depending on how often you update your zoning code, this is going to be enforced for maybe 10 to 50 years. Um, that's very specifically what I have in mind with zoning. I'm not talking about stuff. Most people on this call understand the distinction, but I find that this is a, a, a sort of big preface that you have to give for people who are newer to the topic, not talking about building codes, not talking about almost the entire rest of the city planning uh, infrastructure, right? Things like infrastructure planning, uh, things like environmental uh, regulation. That's all really important. And I cover that in an appendix where, you know, if you want more, uh, go cover that there. Historic preservation and, too, right? Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not saying like there are no problems with all those other policies. In fact, you know, I think Part of I'm at pains in the book to say I think zoning abolition is a necessary but not sufficient policy change to make a lot of progress on a lot of these issues. But so when you I think when you appreciate like zoning, what zoning is specifically and kind of it's I think it's actually somewhat relatively small role that it plays in what we want planning to do. I think the cause of, of abolition becomes significantly less crazy. Um, you know, and I'd say in the near term, right? I think zoning reform makes a lot of sense. And and part of you know what inspired me to write this book is that. I think we're 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 pretty close to something like consensus on a whole bunch of zoning reform pieces, right? Like I was just reading Planning Magazine this month, and there are like four or five articles on, yeah. hey guys, let's you know, let's we need to roll back single exclusionary single family zoning uh, and allow small multifamily in these residential neighborhoods. We need to get rid of owners' parking requirements that that second guess developers and consumers and force people to own cars. Uh -huh. We've got consensus on huge chunks of what zoning does today. That you know, let's reform it. And I think in the near term that makes a lot of sense. But as I argue in the book, you know, I think zoning has just basically failed to do what we want land use regulation to do. You know, I think it, I offer a steel man case for zoning, uh, essentially saying, yeah, of course, like um, you want uh, incompatible uses to be kept separate. Uh, you want some mechanism for dealing with with externalities or or spillover impacts of different uses. Uh, I'm all for that. And then, of course, you want some coordination between growth and infrastructure. You know, I don't think anyone could argue with that. But what I argue in the book is that zoning just hasn't achieved those, right? Um, or and to the extent that it achieves them, it does it in, a, in an extremely conservative way that has all of these uh, spillover costs. So I'm trying to really hit the reset button on the conversation. I think zoning has sucked the air out of the room on land use planning uh, in the United States for the past 100 years. And part of what I want to do is, I'm, and I'm speaking very directly to, to planners here, is to get, you know, my generation of planners and, and people who are motivated uh, by sort of realizing how awry zoning has gone, start thinking, what do we want land use planning to do? What would that look like? And I sketch out a little bit of that in the book. I talk about the interesting example of Houston, uh, but we can get into all that. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we should we should start talking right uh, right now about that. I, I think the two things that really jumped out at uh, at me from the book as the replacements for zoning, uh, as you've described it, are deed restrictions and really this sort of ad hoc allowing, you know, land uses to sort of figure themselves out. I think, you know, deed restrictions have sort of a, a troubled history. And to me, that recalls some of the discriminatory, discriminatory practices of, of the past century. Um, how what can you tell us to reassure us about, uh, you know, private agreements between property owners um, withholding, you know, sort of some of the pernicious effects of discrimination and, and exclusionary zoning and stuff like that? Um, we'll, we'll start there and then and then we can maybe talk about ad hoc land use um, development. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, um, right. So I, deed restrictions come up in the context of Houston, right? Um, so. If, if I'm gonna, I'm making this case for zoning abolition. Uh, naturally, I want to talk a lot about Houston, which is uh, America's fourth largest city. Incidentally, it does not have zoning. 
part of the reason it doesn't have zoning uh, is because it was one of the only major cities that actually put zoning to a vote. Uh, put zoning to a vote three times and it failed uh, all three times. Um, and it's funny because you, if you look at contemporary coverage, right? Uh, so working class Houstonians, uh, black and Hispanic Houstonians uh, overwhelmingly voted against it. Um, and it's funny because if you read contemporary coverage at the time, it's like, oh, they, they were tricked, they were played. Uh, and in retrospect, like kind of knowing what we know now, it's like, well, it actually seems somewhat profitable, right? Um, but in any case, as I argue in the book, part of what made uh, non-zoning in Houston work was that they had to, they developed this compromise, right? So people who do want something like R1 zoning uh, can have it, but they're going to have to put the work in to get their neighbors to sign onto it. Uh, of course, this is for infill. For most for most greenfill development developers, are just slapping on deed restrictions that do everything like an R1 zoning district. Uh, in any case, but you're going to have to voluntarily opt into it. You're going to have to play some role in enforcement. And at least theoretically, there has to be some mechanism where these institutions can change or wither away over time uh, if there's just not actually demand for these rules. Um, and of course, you know, like to the extent that these deed restrictions are just helping people satisfy like lifestyle preferences that they have, that's great. To the extent that they maybe are a sort of mechanism for reinstituting class based segregation, which I think to a certain extent they are, it's not great. But as I argue in the in the book, this was an imperfect compromise that kept uh, that, that small minority of the city that would have wanted something like zoning from advocating for something like zoning. Essentially, a, an opt-out mechanism where you can have something that kind of looks like R1 zoning within your little sphere, but that's not, you're not, we're not going to have this giant um, segregationist infrastructure that covers the entire city, right? And so this is why in Houston, of course, in the vast majority of the city, uh, it's very easy to maybe take a single family home and turn it into three townhouses. Or it's very easy to uh, take that old strip mall and turn it into a five over one. Uh, and you go to Houston and you're just, you know, especially coming from a place like Los Angeles where we build significantly less on a per capita basis, you go to Houston and you're just kind of like smacked over the head with it. You're like, wow, this is a city that's completely transforming itself to reflect changing needs. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, this is, I think, what I'm trying to get at with that chapter in general, I think in the second point that you raised as well is the extent to which markets facilitate some natural sorting, right? This is where I'm trying to just lay the groundwork for uh, non-zoning doesn't mean pure chaos or pure anarchy, right? You know, I think one of the conversations among planners is uh, I think we, we get maybe some of this education from in more conservative planning courses where it's like, why was zoning adopted? <clears throat> well, zoning was adopted. Um, because we needed to stop like oil refineries from opening up on like suburban cul-de-sacs, right? Um, well, and for reasons that I argue in, in part one, that's not why we got zoning, right? <laughs> but part two, right, the, the most incompatible uses, for the most part, um, uh, self-sort. And what we're really, what the challenge of land use planning really is dealing with the edge cases or dealing with the weird exceptions where that isn't the case. Uh, and of course, you need some rec regulatory mechanism uh, for doing that. I don't think it's just private. I actually think there's a really important role that planners need to play here. Um, we can talk about that. Uh, but we need to sort of resituate that, that we're dealing with the edge cases here and that cities actually have natural ways of, of sorting themselves that, that zoning really just kind of second guesses and, and I would say now like stunts, right? I mean, like if you look at a uh, zoning map for New York City, uh, Soho Noho is still labeled industrial, right? Um, right. So you, you get these systems that are locked in that, that, that oversolve for the problem of incompatible uses. Yeah, there was an audience from the question, uh, sorry, a question from the audience. Um, Shelly Dennison asks, uh, and it kind of relates to this point, though, I think. And sh uh, the question is, you know, that zoning gives a framework for efficient decision making. So without zoning, wouldn't we have to make decisions on a parcel by parcel basis? And wouldn't that be burdensome? So maybe that you, you briefly mentioned the role for planners and still making some of these decisions. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about what the decision-making process would look like um, in a self-sorting land use regime. Yeah, so I mean, I, I see two kind of roles for planners here. Uh, the first is, and this is something that planners already kind of do quite a lot of work, but we don't get trained in it and we don't really talk about it, is just role as mediators, right? Um, again, so when we're talking about like light use conflicts as like largely edge cases, uh, in most cases, yeah, we could have tried to have written out an ordinance that would solve the problem, uh, you know, with just our incredible foresight and our AICP certification and just our, our genius. Uh, but in many cases, like the conflict is just going to be solved by like talking to both neighbors and coming up with a resolution. 
and then making it clear that like, hey, the threat of litigation is lurking in the background here. You guys kind of have an incentive to solve this problem. I give a few examples of that happening uh, in the book, and and I think it would be actually positive if if, if more planners approach there work that way. And I, and the practicing planners who I know do just quite a lot of this. Uh, the second is what do we want to regulate, right? Um, so you know, I think what zoning is trying to do in a very clumsy way is to deal with with externalities, right? And uh, but the problem, and it's but it does this through uh, listing out land uses, right? The idea being that like certain types of land uses intrinsically have certain impacts. Um, and so this is why you get like very weird zoning districts that we have today where it's like, no, sorry, we will not allow corner groceries in residential neighborhoods because that's a commercial use and not a residential use. Um, or we will not allow, you know, we won't allow any commercial spaces in residential areas uh, because it could be a bar and the bar could be really noisy and loud and offensive. Um, what I think the appropriate role for public land use regulation here actually would create a lot of value is just really finally tailor those rules that actually regulate impacts, right? Things like noise, things like traffic generation, things like light pollution. Um, cities, the varying degrees, are more and more sophisticated at regulating these things. And I think to a certain extent, when you when you know, for example, uh, that certain nuisance behaviors are not going to emerge, uh, the, the reluctance around allowing new forms of development near you goes away. Of course, there are some people who are always going to oppose everything, and I'm sure that many of the planners on the call uh, know exactly who that person is in your community. Um, but I think the average person uh, is relatively open to new development, but is concerned about some of the impacts that might uh, spill over. And to the extent that we as planners can say, yeah, we have a framework for dealing with that. Uh, we have a system of, of regulations and prices that will internalize a lot of those activities. Uh, I think you're just gonna get a better system that does what, what people actually want land use regulation to do. Um, you know, I would say to the point about the parcel by parcel, uh, you know, I think like the zoning at its best, right? was like, we're gonna have like clear, simple rules. And if you follow those rules, you're gonna get your permits. And, you know, to varying degrees, zoning still works like that in, in some contexts. But in, in the places that I think are further along on a lot of the crises that I highlight in the book, it doesn't really work like that uh, anymore. Huge numbers of uh, development projects in a place like Los Angeles are having to go through a process, a project by project discretionary process. Um, and it doesn't really, it increasingly looks less and less like planning and just more of a kind of reactive project by project uh, negotiation. And sort of he, here in Los Angeles, of course, we're in the end game of that where housing is very, very expensive and it's very difficult to build, especially in affluent areas. And so, you know, rather than I think playing this game, I think let's let's retool our system of land use regulation around actual impacts uh, and having a system of regulation and prices uh, that get us there. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about uh, zoning abolition being mm -hmm. a necessary but not sufficient step, is that, have you captured everything else that's necessary to achieve sufficiency or is there are there other aspects that maybe you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I I think a few things here. Um, so I already talked about, I think, we need to be much more serious about the actual impacts, uh, actual impacts and, and externalities in cities, right? Uh, when you live in Manhattan, you become very radical on noise, uh, <laughs> right? Um, you know, like, I think part of the reason that we got a, a very clumsy and ham-handed system like zoning was that we couldn't really regulate things like noise, or it was very difficult to uh, take stock of how much traffic is being generated by a particular use. Um, but, you know, we're pretty good at that now, and, and planners are actually pretty sophisticated at this, and we can actually, you know, retool our system of land use regulation around those specific things, and I think that would be positive. The second is, I, I think planners, of course, have a really important role to play um, in, in housing, uh, right? So even in a context of housing abundance, there's still going to be segments of the market that aren't, or segments of, 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 of renters who are not served by the market. Um, you need uh, local, state, and federal programs that ensure that below market rate housing is being built. And you can, you can uh, deploy those programs in clever ways that also serve the objective of desegregating cities, right? You know, I, of course, if you look out over the past century of, zone, of planning and zoning in particular, um, segregation has been the official policy. And I think it's actually really important that planners play some role in, in sort of backing us out of this extremely dysfunctional status quo. Um, you know, encouraging, providing subsidies for developers to include below market rate units in new projects, especially in affluent areas, uh, in gentrifying neighborhoods, buying up uh, naturally occurring affordable housing and de-restricting it so that people don't get displaced. Um, 
planners have a super important role to play in all of that. And I think that's, you know, this is another element here that, that tee up my, my final point. I think it's another sort of underrated cost of zoning. Uh, you know, maybe this is just my personal experience, but in my experience in the planning civil service, an incredible amount of state capacity and just hours and time of extremely competent, passionate people are sort of wasted on micromanaging the number of parking spaces and strip malls or keeping fourplexes out of, of cul-de-sacs. Um, I, met, I, meet, I met and I continue to meet so many smart, ambitious planners who have great big ideas for their communities and they're sort of trapped in the system of zoning, this, this regulatory framework that was written 100 years ago and that nobody really believes in anymore. Um, and to the extent that we can like liberate them from that system, I think you know, American cities have nothing uh, but positive to come from it. And the last sort of portion of, of this, I want to think planning will have to refocus on after zoning is a renewed focus on actual physical planning um, and, and recentering, I think, the comprehensive plan which is really really where we do our planning. And, and these are documents where you can really do public engagement and you can really set a broader vision and you can really do the data work necessary to figure out how's our community gonna change, uh, right? You know, you look at many cities, uh, maybe the typical suburb in America today, they'll have an incredibly complicated zoning ordinance uh, with rules for every possible development on every possible lot. And then they won't have a streets plan. Uh, you know, they won't actually have a plan for a street grid as the city expands outward. And so you get these cities where they micromanaging uh, the minor details of development on private land, and then the public realm, there's just no actual uh, thought put into it. And, and you, what you end up getting is these communities where it's you know a sprawling mess of cul-de-sacs and, and, and aimless winding streets. And then of course, most people don't live within walking distance from a park. Um, I think in terms of where planners can add value, it's really that sort of you know nuts and bolts physical planning that planners did for, for thousands of years. Uh, where we can really add the most value. And that's why I think, you know, to the extent that that uh, you can engage in that type of physical planning work, you are going to shape the form of the city and the type of private development that you get uh, in large measure. Yeah, great. And that actually, uh, there was a question about the difference in the importance between future land use planning and um, zoning. And I think, I think you've addressed that. So Naomi, hopefully you got your answer to that question there. Um, uh, so I want to back up to something you mentioned earlier, and this uh, this will be my last question before I start to dig more into the audience questions. You talked about the inversion of historic migration trends in the country away from uh, what, what in the past has been people moving toward more affluent, uh, productive, efficient cities. And now we see a lot of people moving away from those, those cities toward less affluent, less productive, less efficient cities. My concern is that uh, in presenting it that way, not only does it sort of pigeonhole uh, zoning reform as as a primary benefit of some of these more affluent cities, but it plays out like a zero sum game where there's where there's only so many winners in the economy. Um, so I, I think maybe I'd like to hear a little bit more about what the benefit of zoning reform can be for these medium sized mm -hmm. cities, these growing cities, um, for for better or worse in this in this economy that we have that's that's displacing people from these more efficient wealthier cities. You know, where does how how can zoning reform be a net benefit for as many cities and as many communities as possible? Yeah, that's a that's a really great and thoughtful uh, question. So, I mean, when, when people were moving, when Americans would move from less affluent, lower productivity regions to higher uh, productivity, more affluent regions, part of what they're doing, of course, is they're moving to a place and their incomes are rising and they're becoming more productive. And that, you know, that city in a certain sense is becoming uh, wealthier. But also part of what they're doing is um, uh, they're increasing uh, wages in the places that they've left. Right. So these are places that might have a surplus of, of labor or just might not be having the investment uh, and, and economic development needed to make sure that everyone who lives in those places has access to a decent job and decent housing. Um, right. So that's how that's. It, and, and then meanwhile, they move to a very wealthy productivity place where their wages are higher, but they're also increasing the labor supply and they're reducing um, the labor constraints in those places and slightly reducing wages potentially, right? So you get this evening, you get this regional evening out that's happening, uh, right? Those poor places are actually becoming a little bit wealthier and the super wealthy places are becoming maybe a little bit more normal uh, to put it in a nice way. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that's I think what was going on for most of, of American. And if you can, even until like the 1970s, I mean, there's a fascinating chart in, in uh, 
uh, Kevin Erdman's book, uh, showing like we didn't really have this notion of like rich cities and poor cities uh, until you know the past 50 years, right? It it was there it wasn't the case that that certain cities were just dramatically more expensive than others. They were you know they were slightly more expensive and slightly cheaper cities, but they were broadly clustered and where you lived was not determined by where can you afford a decent house. This is the big thing for me that, you know, I'm always stressing here, of course, here in LA, and I'm sure you hear the same thing, James, uh, people say, oh, if LA is too expensive, just why did you move here? Just don't move here, move away. Um, and that's, that's easy to say, I think, to a transplant. Um, but you might know this, uh, a lot of people are born in Los Angeles, right? Um, like there are people that want to stay here. Um, and uh, I don't think anyone should be forced to uh, leave their community behind and move just to access decent, affordable housing. Um, and not only that, but yeah, I actually think we can do one better and build a place where everyone who wants to move to a place like Los Angeles can afford to have a decent, affordable house. What we've done today, where I think the status quo policy is very much this zero sum mindset of like, okay, well, there's only so much housing in Los Angeles. Uh, we can't build more for reasons. Uh, because we don't want to actually contend with, I think, the policies that are blocking new housing from being built. And so what ends up happening, of course, is this musical chairs where, frankly, someone like me who is a transplant uh, can afford to bid up the price of an apartment and then a local kid uh, can't. And, you know, I think we get into these very unhealthy discourses uh, about, you know, uh, that almost get kind of xenophobic about, oh, well, outsiders are to blame. Um, and it's like, well, no, like the problem is there just aren't enough chairs, right? The problem is there isn't enough housing. Uh, and when you have insufficient housing, of course, it's the people at the bottom of the market who feel the pressure the most. I'm just reading this great book, uh, forgetting the author's name, but uh, housing is almost this problem. And they make this exact point, like how do you, what, what, what predicts regional variation in, in rates of homelessness? And it's, it's not individual predictors of homelessness, it's not poverty, it's not unemployment, it's not uh, mental issues and substance abuse, uh, it's average rent and it's vacancy rate. Um, when average rents are high and vacancy rates are low, uh, there's, you know, extreme amounts of competition for a limited supply of housing and the people at the bottom of the market get hurt most. So, you know, I mean, back to your original question, right? I think we've created a framework where many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans are forced to leave the place that they're from, uh, to find affordable, decent housing. And yeah, I'm to stress, like, uh, I love Orlando. I love Phoenix. These are great places. And actually, I think they deserve a lot of credit for absorbing all these people who have, you know, otherwise been sort of cast out by places like New York City or Los Angeles. Uh, but nobody should be forced to move there because that's what they have to do to get a decent home. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, and I think that that point about the zero sum game actually being the status quo is is really well said. Um, and I think, yeah, that should be the motivation for for these reforms. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into the questions. A little bit from the the group and and uh we had a question before the webinar started and now we have a question from donald shoop himself so the question is uh how what do you think about form-based codes and where does that fit into this um and for those who don't know form-based codes are sort of in the last couple of decades been a popular zoning reform proposition where we're where zoning codes focus less on use and more on the built form of the of the buildings and how they interact with the public realm um, What's your take on form-based codes as as a piece of the puzzle in this zoning reform or zoning abolition movement? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so I, th I think this is an oversight in the book. I don't really deal directly with form-based codes, uh, but I'll, I'll address them in the sequel. Uh, uh, arbitrary lines two, two arbitrary two lines. Um, <laughs> but um, but so I mean, my my general thoughts on form-based codes, I like. For number one, I think the new urbanists just don't get a lot of credit for paving the way for a lot of the zoning reform discussions that we have today. Uh, but I think the theory of form-based codes makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, regulate for the things that people actually care about. So you don't need really strict rules uh, on what the use that's happening in a building or the amount of floor area in the building, right? That's like zoning, like zoning essentially does uh, urban design, but with this wild cocktail of like setbacks and lot coverage and floor area ratios. Um, so, you know, to the extent that a community says, hey, we want the we want the neighborhood to look generally like this, I think form-based codes are a better way of getting that, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, and, you know, Houston, of course, which is a, a, a city that I spend a lot of time talking about in the book, uh, they've adopted uh, a, a TOD ordinance that has a lot of form-based elements, right? If you're going to build near light rail, you have to put the parking lot behind the building. Uh, you have to sit relatively close to the right-of-way. 
uh, that all makes sense to me. And that's, again, that's regulating what people actually care about other than this kind of the strange convoluted game that we play. I'll say in practice, I've been a little underwhelmed by a lot of form-based codes. Um, many of the ones that I've seen end up just being overlays on an existing zoning ordinance. In, in the best of cases, they replace or are an alternative track for development to follow. I think in the worst of cases, they're just like a design overlay on top of a really bad zoning code. So it's like, when now, like not only, not only do you have to build like two parking spaces per apartment, and also you can't have any ground floor retail, but also now we're gonna have like a, a, a three-story height limit and like you have to sit really close to the right of way. Like to me, that's just kind of the worst of all possible worlds. But so I think there is a, 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 a place for form-based codes here. And I think the, the, the sentiment of people who have been developing form-based codes is, is, is very much in the right direction. Yeah, I think you're talking about the, the hybrid zoning code that uh, is really what we're talking about a lot of times now when when uh, form-based codes are proposed. It's really a mix of of use regulation and form regulation. Um, but let, maybe sticking still a little bit close to that that discussion about use and and where where that affects you know the results in a neighborhood. I don't want to use the word character, but uh, <laughs> even though I just did. Um, a couple of questions from from attendees uh, asked about mix of uses, and that's something we haven't really t dug into too much uh, on this call yet. Uh, so, what about zoning reform or zoning abolition uh, specifically can help you know address issues like food deserts or mm -hmm. um, you know not having access to fresh food or other daily new needs in um, in neighborhoods? Um, yeah. So, can you talk a little bit about about what a mix of uses would look like under a, zone, a really reformed uh, or a abolished zoning regime? Yeah, so, you know, I, I suspect that, you know, when you when you sort of first articulate the abolished zoning case, I think people immediately think of like, right, what I was saying, the oil refinery in the, in the, in the cul-de-sac. But realistically, especially when you talk about breaking down commercial and residential segregation, realistically, what you're gonna get a lot more of is like a corner grocery. In a residential neighborhood or maybe somebody cutting hair out of their garage or maybe uh, a dentist or a doctor uh, seeing patients uh, in her in her um, you know in her basement right um, these are like extremely normal and pleasant things that happened basically all of human history uh, until 1916 when we decided that we knew better um, and it's funny too I mean this is the way I, I frame zoning reform uh, you know not to say anything about zoning abolition uh, is when I'm in a city, I can normally point to a neighborhood that everybody in that city loves. Uh, and it's a neighborhood that's a mix of like, you know, single family homes and duplexes and fourplexes. And there's a little corner deli that everybody loves. Uh, and there's a little corner barbershop that everybody loves. And I just say, hey, that's illegal to build today, right? And it's, it be, then, it, then it really clicks, especially with people who don't spend all day, every day thinking about use regulation. Like, okay, right? Like, we that should not be illegal. This is very nice. Um, so, you know, I think that that's, and, and the food desert point is, I think, really key, because if you look at the typical suburban or big city zoning ordinance, there's clearly this notion that, like, uh, the place where you buy groceries and the place where you live are going to be different places, and you're going to drive between them, right? Um, and there's going to be this sort of artificial scarcity of places where you can and can't uh, operate a business. Uh, and uh, historically, that's just not how we built cities, right? Historically, you, you did have a, a little supermarket or a little grocery or a deli within the walking distance. Um, and certainly based on land prices today in neighborhoods that have stuff like this, uh, land prices are, are extremely high, people want this. So I think certainly the, the food desert piece of it is really important, the economic opportunity uh, piece of it is really important. Is there, is there an inexpensive little storefront uh, in your community uh, where you can open a business? Uh, or you know, there's been a lot of discourse recently, which I think is really interesting about this notion of accessory commercial units. Um, you know, hey, if I'm on a if I'm on a street corner, uh, can I add a little additional retail space and maybe run a business there? Again, historically, that's what people did. A lot of a lot of our legacy commercial corridors uh, are, you know, giant single family homes where somebody built a commercial space out in front of it. Right. I was just in Sacramento uh, in Midtown and there's an entire bustling commercial corridor. that's just exactly that. So I think reintroducing some of that flexibility into the system allows people to solve problems like food deserts that we currently make literally illegal to solve. Yep, great. Um, so this is this question uh, is a little bit might come as a little surprise. And as a luddite, I'm curious to hear, or like a relative luddite, uh, what technologies, if any, would facilitate 
the transit away from the uh, or the transition away from current zoning regulations do you are there hmm. i mean I, i'm thinking this uh, you know the electric car or the uh or the automated vehicle is one potential angle on this but there there are others um do you, can you identify any others or uh, that might help with this process that's an interesting question um you know, I should have developed the technology that I that travels with the book. So then it's like, you know, in the last five pages, it's like, you know, purchase this. I, I mean, I, I would say two things on this. The first, the mobility piece, for sure. Uh, it's never been easier to get around without a car. Uh, anyone who's been on an on an e-scooter or an e-bicycle uh, knows. Uh, like, I, I almost feel like the state of California should just pay every Californian like 20 bucks to spend an hour riding an e-bike around because you, you spend like 30 minutes on it. And you're like, OK, this is the technology of the future. So, you know, that's, a, I think, a huge part, right? This a zoning framework that's built from the bottom up around having a car and where you're going to put cars uh, and assuming and mandating that everybody owns a car has, made, has never made less sense than it does today in a certain way. Because we have, I think, these new mobility technologies that genuinely are transformative. And I think local DOT and planning offices should absolutely be thinking in very serious ways about how we're going to accommodate that. I'd say the second is in terms of the like the regulating what people actually care about piece, um, you know, get back to noise, right? I think there's really exciting things happening on this front. Uh, of course, Paris has been rolling out their kind of like noise cameras, right? Right, where if 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 a car is generating too much noise or if a certain use is generating a ton of noise, you immediately know it and you know where it is. And and in the case of a car, you can just immediately issue a ticket. Um, and so we can be very sophisticated about regulating some of these impacts uh, that historically we probably couldn't have, right? Um, and same with parking, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna just, uh, since Shook is on the call, right? Um, you know, I think parking is, is one of these concerns that people have. They oppose new development and they say, well, where am I gonna park, right? All the spaces on my block are already full. And if, you're, if you allow this new housing to be built without an off-street parking space, they're just gonna flood the street and I'm gonna have to circle the block for hours. Well, you know, we have the technology now to, pretty quickly uh, determine what the on-street parking capacity is and what the price should be. Uh, and you can design programs that uh, both effectively manage your on-street parking and then create new public revenue that can be used for public improvements, like repaving the sidewalks or planting street trees. Yeah, great. Um, okay, there's been a couple of questions about how US zoning compares to other countries. And I know that's kind of outside mm -hmm. of the scope of your book, but um, we've had questions specifically about Canada and the UK. Are there examples of zoning reform or just, you know, long established differences between the zoning systems in, the, in, in those countries, maybe specifically, and maybe other countries around the world that you think can inform a little bit more of an understanding about what the zoning reform effort will take? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, just at the outset, right, this is a problem all across the Anglosphere. Uh, I was just earlier this week, I just had a call with with uh, some uh, planners in the United Kingdom who are dealing with very similar issues. Uh, the planning systems are quite different. I, I would actually suggest that uh, you should first go buy my book, but uh, then you can buy um, Sonia Hertz book, Zoned in the USA, which is, has, a, has a good, co it covers the comparative uh, land use element. I would say that the to a certain extent, this is almost certainly true in places like Canada and New Zealand and, and the UK, right? So they have these land use frameworks uh, that make it very, very, very hard to build, especially hard to build infill. And of course, that translates into higher costs. And there was just research. I mean, New Zealand dramatically liberalized a lot of elements of their code over the last few years. And we're already seeing dividends from this. There's just research that came out that this is stimulating new infill development. Uh, and it's going to have downward pressure on, it's going to put downward pressure on prices, right? Um, so, you know, I think certainly we all have a lot to learn from each other and we need to be having these conversations in an international uh, context. I mean, the U U.S. zoning is, I think, weird in the extent to which it privileges the single family home, the detached single family home, uh, right? So I think, you know, um, this, this extreme uh, focus on uh, reserving residential land for single family homes to the detriment of things like townhouses or duplexes or fourplexes. This is, I think, a very uniquely American thing, possibly in, in Canada as well. Um, and, you know, this is, I think, an exciting thing to a certain extent because, hey, look, every other developed country doesn't do this and the world doesn't fall. Um, in the book, I do talk a little bit about uh, Japan, which Japan has, you know, they, they call it they call it zoning, but it's, it's very different in, in almost every meaningful sense from the way we do it here. Um, 
So, of course, in Japan, the national government basically says, here are the districts, here are the districts that you can map, and here are their parameters, and then locals actually map those districts. And so I think a benefit of this is, of course, you don't have every single municipality reinventing the wheel and writing its own zoning code, as we do here in the U.S., uh, but also you can uh, have relatively liberal districts, right? So even in, in Japan, their most restrictive uh, zoning district uh, is meant for low-rise residential, but it allows three-story multifamily buildings. It allows uh, that, that corner of grocery. Uh, it allows home offices that are still illegal in much of the U.S. Um, so, you know, we can we can learn from cases like that or or uh, an example. Uh, another example is uh, France. Right. Um, if you were to look at the zoning map for for Paris, it would be almost recognizable, uh, unrecognizable. Um, you know, it, it has a, a very small number of, of generally very flexible zoning districts that are largely agnostic about stuff like use and density, which we would tie ourselves into knots over here in the United States. And it's basically just focused on form and protecting natural areas, right? Um, you know, if we can move toward a zoning system that looks like uh, a Japan model or a, a France model, I think we'd be making a lot of progress. Yeah, cool. Um, so getting back to sort of the state of zoning in the United States uh, on a spectrum from, you know, pure 20th century exclusionary zoning, Euclidean zoning, um, uh, toward you know the the vision that you've proposed with your book, you know where where would you uh, say that the country is as a collection you know in the aggregate, and and what will it take to continue to move uh, toward your the vision that you propose in the book, engaging stakeholders um, or you know figuring out what what pieces need to be in place in, in, instead of zoning. Yeah, well, you know, so I, I'll just say at the outset that I'm actually very optimistic uh, about this policy space. Um, you know, I, there's a, I think there's a reading of my book that is very negative, right? In a certain sense, a lot of the book is a critique uh, and a sort of overview of what, have, of what has gone wrong uh, with land use planning, and that's all important. Uh, but, you know, I, I closed the book, part three, very deliberately with a big picture, hey, you know, we can do better. Uh, a better world is possible. Not a lot of people know that, right? Um, and there's a lot of energy around this issue right now. I mean, it's like I said at the top of the conversation, um, you know, people are thinking about this in a way that, that we haven't thought about maybe for 100 years. Um, and so this is really exciting. I would say a few things, you know, that we can be doing. I think the first is, and, and this is probably the, the way to put reform on the, on the firmest footing, is, is changing people's ideas about what, you know, what a city could be, right? Uh, so, you know, I think for a lot, for, for many decades, uh, 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 urbanists, we articulated our, our sort of perspective as this almost like eat your vegetables uh, approach to urbanism. Like, yeah, like, sorry, climate change is happening and housing costs are, are rising. So we're really sorry. You're going to have to live in a townhouse uh, near a light rail station and within walking distance of a park and a grocery. And uh, you have to ride your bike every now and then. Right. And it was it was this very like, I know it's like a, a horrible nightmare. Um, you know, like we don't, I think it's actually okay to present that as a vision of like, Hey, this is an exciting thing. It wouldn't it be great if you had housing choice in your community? Wouldn't it be great. You know, I'm, I'm not the certain type of planner who is, um, beating up on people who want to live in a single family home in the middle of nowhere. It's not my preferred mode of living. Uh, but I think at the very least, we should have the option to do something different for people who want that. And based on prices, uh, many millions of Americans want that. Uh, they, they, they are bidding up the price of, of housing that is in urban walkable neighborhoods uh, and near transit or in bikeable communities. Uh, so that's the first, you know, I think sort of reframe it and, and show like what kind of communities could be built uh, and, and, and talking to people and, and making them actually want that, right? As opposed to this whole thing of like, well, sorry, housing costs are, are going up, so we just have to legalize apartments. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's perfectly, that's, you know, part of the story, but that's, I think, not going to win uh, converts. Uh, the second is, I, I think a lot of places need to be having conversations at the state level. Um, so, you know, here, I think in California, a lot of what has really worked has been removing some parts of this conversation from the hyper local level, right? So, you know, having a conversation of, well, like, accessory dwelling units should be allowed anywhere in California. Let's just set a, a baseline set of rules uh, for everywhere in California. And if you meet these rules, you can build an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and number one, it hasn't ended up being that controversial. Uh, and um, 
Uh, number two, it's actually getting units built. And I would say, I was, you know, if you pull up to any intersection in in Los Angeles now, you'll see like three signs. It'll be like, I buy junk cars, uh, free divorce consultation, uh, and um, I'll build an ADU, right? And to my mind, that's like, that's what like success looks like. So, you know, other states can be, I think, learning from some of the experience, that, the experience experiments that we've run here in California with stuff like housing fair share and stuff like state level uh, involvement. And then the third, I think is increasingly, this is a national problem and we, we do need leadership at the federal government. Um, you know, we need uh, uh, sticks and carrots uh, to sort of get local governments to start opening up their zoning codes and thinking about reform or thinking about what, what land use regulation might look like after zoning. You can say, hey, if you, if, if you're going to be receiving transit money, we want to see a plan for allowing density around that transit station. Or, hey, if we're going to be giving you surface transportation grants, we want to see progress on, on parking policy. Or if you're going to get community development block grants, um, we want to see progress on the most exclusionary portions of zoning. Um, and that's a perfectly valid and I think important role for the federal government to play. Yeah, so I, I, this is one last question, and I just want to quickly piggyback on that discussion uh, about the different scales of government in, intervention possible. What about the scale of zoning reforms within the city? Uh, you know, there's this kind of a discussion that's emerging right now about the difference in effect uh, between citywide zoning changes and changes implemented along corridors. The city of Boise, for instance, just completely scaled back their proposed citywide uh, zoning reforms and, and now they're just focusing on quarters. What's your impression about the need for citywide scale uh, to achieve the outcomes that are desired? Yeah, no, I, I think I think I think the approach should be citywide generally. I mean, so historically, this is when when cities have gotten themselves in a really tough situation and they are, you know, reluctantly admit that we finally have to do zoning reform. They do exactly that. They they will do little area uh, rezonings. The problem is that generally speaking, those put housing in all too often in the worst places, right? Uh, so, you know, it, the upzoning will happen in a low income neighborhood where political resistance is just weakest or uh, the rezoning will happen along a sort of busy, noisy commercial corridor, which on the one hand, right, I don't necessarily have any problem with, with building there, uh, but you know, why would, why would you allow a 501 on, on a major corridor, but then you're not gonna allow a fourplex in a nice quiet residential side street, right? Um, so, you know, I think it's hard to say, like, in the abstract, right, of course, uh, if, if upzoning the corridor is the best you can do on zoning reform, and there are many such cases, uh, go for it, right? That's, that's probably the best that can be done. Um, but I think exactly to your point, uh, the, the approach has to be citywide, right? So when we do, we see this over and over again, I, I talk about it when I talk about minimum lot size reform in Houston, uh, when they lower minimum lot sizes for the entire area of the city within the 610 loop, which is basically the urban area of Houston, uh, what they saw was that there was, it wasn't just this extreme concentration of redevelopment happening in maybe one area or in an area that probably wasn't best for housing. It was a lot of uh, new housing getting built in middle or upper middle income neighborhoods, right? In, in places that uh, maybe were relatively close to jobs, uh, right? So this gets like, I, I think this, this is I think a general sort of way that I think about these issues, right, is, is just, give some flexibility back to the system, right? Like get, let cities be cities um, in a way that we haven't allowed them to be for the past 100 years. And of course you need really thoughtful plans for public services and infrastructure uh, and, and how you're gonna make sure the growth is equitable and all of that's really important and planners have a super important role to play in it. But this whole notion that of, well, we're just, we're gonna micromanage every private development and we're gonna master plan uh, the private redevelopment of this corridor in, in down to the minor detail, I think it just doesn't get the goods and it ends up consuming a lot of public service capacity that could have been better used uh, in different ways. Yeah, cool, let's end really quickly. We've got two more minutes. Um, there's a bunch of notes in the chat for everybody uh, about where to get discounts for both courses and for arbitrary lines and to get your AICP CM credits. Um, so well, somebody asked us to say what our favorite um, in neighborhoods that sort of showcase the potential of, of zoning reform uh, is. So let's just, mm -hmm. uh, to, to end this in kind of a fun way, uh, I, I would throw out Wicker Park in Chicago, which I was recently, uh, I recently got to spend a couple of weeks there, and it was just transit oriented. 
and dense and fun and active. It was brilliant. It was exactly what the kind of neighborhood I want to live in. Um, do you have a, a a quick example that you can cite? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Kowloon Walled City in Hong Kong. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, I yeah, you know, I got I got to rep my hometown, Kenwick, uh, uh, Kenwick in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, it's a nice neighborhood. It's single family homes mixed in with low rise multifamily. Uh, there's a nice little corner deli. Uh, there's churches. There's uh, barber shops. There's doctor's offices. Um, it's extremely walkable. It's um, you know, it's close to downtown. It's probably like, you know, it's not this, it's not Manhattan, which I think a lot of people think is going to happen when zoning reform happens. It's just this nice, slightly more diverse, slightly more walkable community. Yeah. And I'm sure that both of us could, could go on all day. We could have a whole hour, another uh, long call to talk about our favorite neighborhoods. And I, I want to you know, iterate for my part, and I think it's very clear from reading your book too, and talking with you today, that um, that all all places deserved to be prosperous and healthy, and and that's mm -hmm. what we're working toward and having these kind of conversations. So, um, yeah, thanks everybody for all your questions. Really appreciate it. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them, but we covered a lot of ground. And uh, thanks, Nolan, for taking the time to talk with us all about the book. And uh, if you haven't bought the book yet, please buy it. Um, you'll enjoy it. And um, hopefully we'll keep this conversation moving forward and, um, and come up with some productive reforms. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks so much, James. And thanks for everyone that came out. If we didn't get to your question, feel free to uh, yell at me on Twitter. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Nolan Gray. So. And thanks again. Cool.